I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Blair Rubel, and I am a, a dis distinguished fellow here at the Wilson Center, and I want to welcome everyone on behalf of Jane Harmon, our president and CEO. Um, Jane is, we have multiple events uh, going on, and she wanted to be sure that everybody knew how much she values uh, this event, this lecture. And uh, it's an important event for the center. Uh, we've been honored to host the Czech and Slovak Freedom Lecture for more than 15 years. And uh, the series has had many distinguished uh, speakers. And today is no exception. You, you all are in for a treat. And this year's lecture is especially significant because we're 30 years uh, out from the Velvet Revolution and uh, it's, it's time to reflect on how the world has changed, how it hasn't changed, uh, what the lessons are from that event. Um, and we were talking earlier about how um, some people have expectations that the worst outcome will happen and other people have wishes that the best outcome will happen. I think what is true is that truly historic events are low probability outcomes, which is why they surprise us. And in this instance, they um, caught our imagination and surprised us with joy and, and uh, with happiness. So it's a good point to reflect back and also look to the future. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the continuing support for this series of our co-sponsors, uh, the Embassy of the Czech Republic, the Embassy of the Slovak Republic, American Friends of the Czech Republic, and Friends of Slovakia. And I very much want to acknowledge the warm uh, friendship of Ambassador Ivan Korczyk and Ambassador Komnicek uh, from uh, the Czech and the Slovak Republics. The Velvet Revolution in some ways appears even more remarkable with each passing year, uh, both in the scale and depth of the transformation it brought about in a peaceful manner and in um, a really amazing transformation in the center of Europe. And we, um, we think that this, we want to underscore the importance of the moral clarity that was involved in the underlying political change. Uh, it, 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 it's not always the case that uh, events, such political events, have a, a, a moral standing, but I think uh, here we're talking about such an event. I, I'm not gonna dwell much longer on introductions. I, I'm in a moment going to introduce uh, first um, Ambassador Korczyk, who will then introduce his uh, speaker. But I, um, I wanna mention that this is the official presidential memorial to our 28th president, Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson, of course, has a very deep connection uh, to the Czech Republic and to Slovakia. Uh, and when we were established, the idea was to memorialize Wilson's legacy of bringing together the world of ideas and world of public affairs. And I think that our speakers today very much represent that Wilsonian ideal, uh, which makes them a particularly appropriate pair of speakers uh, for us today. So with that in mind, I will invite Ambassador Korczuk to come up and to introduce our first speaker. <coughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Uh, welcome to uh, the 2019 Freedom Lecture. I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Rubble, dear Blair, for nice introductory remarks and the Wilson Center for having us again for this annual event. As you have said, this is a special year and timing for um, our today's Freedom Lecture can hardly be better. Our two nations are remembering the most important milestone in our modern history, the Velvet Revolution of 1989, and I'm glad that this year's Freedom Lecture fits perfectly into the series of uh, uh, events that we've been organizing here in Washington, D.C., but in other cities across the United States. And it, those, all those events are um, 
our contribution to upholding the legacy of 1989 because this legacy, 30 years on, I believe it is fair to say that when looking around, we see that the history um, has not ended in 1989, goes on, and in view of development uh, globally, but including in, in all countries in the West, the struggle for democracy uh, never ends, and struggle for freedom and values we stood for in 1989. I am pleased to introduce the um, Freedom Lecture speaker from Slovakia, the Chairwoman of Foreign Affairs Committee and Vice Chairwoman of the European Affairs Committee of the Slovak Parliament, Katarina Čefavajová, with her and Šimon Panek from the Czech Republic. I think we have a very good combination of speakers because they can look at what happened in 1989 from different perspectives with Shimon Panek, we have somebody who stood there on the stages and he was part of the revolution, one of the key figures. And I'm glad we have him here today with us. At the same time, we have here a politician, Katarina Cefavajova, and she can and she will provide us with her perspective of uh, what happened 30 years ago. But at the end, I'm certain that both of them um, because they are active in political life in Czech Republic and Slovakia, they know, they both know exactly what people's, our people's um, perceptions are when it comes to 1989, how they as associate their current life with what the promise was of 1989. And at the end of the day, they both know exactly how we have been dealing with freedom that we have regained in 1989. In addition, I am glad that Katarina Cefavajva will deliver this year Slovak part of Freedom Lecture because she has made many, many times, I can tell you, very clear where, where she stands when it comes to Slovak foreign policy. She is a strong proponent of transatlantic bond and strong pro-EU voice in Slovakia. Moreover, I have experienced that when I was back home. She has not been afraid, never afraid, of loudly opposing those in Slovakia who believe that the place of our country, of Slovakia, is somewhere between the West and the East, and sh so is she vehemently opposing uh, many demagogues and, and populists who are spreading disinformation. Katarina Cefavajva, before joining politics, she uh, has had an accomplished academic career. She served as a vice dean of the University of Economics in Bratislava. And more importantly, I want to remind you that she is, she is the third woman to present a freedom lecture after <coughs> Madam Secretary of State Madeleine Albright in 2001 and our former Prime Minister Iveta Radicova. I'm confident that after Slovakia elected for the first time in its history a female president, Katarina will attract and encourage other women to join politics, not easy, but um, public life as well. With these words, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome the Chair of Foreign Relations Committee of uh, the Parliament of Slovak Republic, Katarina Cefavajova, and Katarina, I'd like to give the floor now to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests, it's a true honor for me to be here to present this year's annual Freedom Lecture for the Slovak Pot. It's a privilege to be following the many successful, well-respected personalities, politicians, diplomats, scientists, and leaders of the Velvet Revolution from both Czech Republic and Slovakia that have presented this lecture in the previous years. It's a special honor and pleasure, as Mr. Ambassador pointed out, to be the third woman to do so after Madeleine Albright and Iveta Radicova. 
I'm happy that I can commemorate the events of November 89 here in Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States. This country was during the times of oppression and lack of freedom for our parents and several generations of people living behind the Iron Curtain, a lighthouse of freedom, democracy, and prosperity. So many of our fellow citizens from Czechoslovakia have found their new home here, saving their lives and their freedom. We should not forget that the United States played a key role in our pursuit of freedom throughout the 20th century, starting with its endorsement of the establishment of Czechoslovakia during and after World War I, next by helping save Europe from Nazism during World War II, and finally by assisting the forces of mostly underground dissent survive the oppression and maintain the commitment to the fight for freedom. The United States has been one of the strongest advocates for the revolutionary changes in Central and Eastern Europe and the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia in 1989. Partners in the U.S., including the U.S. Congress, recognize that these, quote, remarkable events led to the end of Cold War and the creation of a Europe, whole, free, and at peace, unquote. On November 17, 1989, as the people in Czechoslovakia took to the streets, the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate were deliberating the SEED Act, which stands for Support for Eastern European Democracy, a bill to promote political democracy and economic pluralism in Poland and Hungary. The day prior, November 16, the leader of the Polish Solidarność, Lech Walesa, spoke to the US, U.S. Congress and appealed for U.S. assistance. Assistance extended to democracy and freedom in Poland and in all of Eastern Europe is the best investment in the future and in peace, better than tanks, warships, and warplanes, an investment leading to greater security, he said. And the U.S. partners listened. Thereafter, the U.S. fully recognized our growing pains associated with the difficult transitions from dictatorship to democracy and from a command economy to the free market. One concrete example among hundreds, the U.S. funded technical assistance projects were instrumental in establishing independent parliamentary administrations and transformation of the formal rules of procedure, the way of functioning of our parliament. After 30 years, it is time not only to look back to 89 and to evaluate where we have come and what we have achieved, <clears throat> but also to look into the future and to recognize the threats to the most valuable treasures that our parents have achieved for us, freedom and democracy. It would be naive to think that winning the fight of 89 means a victory for eternity, a happily ever after, the end of history. <coughs> a mere glance at Slovakia's neighbors to the south and to the north, but also to other countries, tells us that it is not the case and that we have to be vigilant and avoid falling into the trap of taking democracy for granted as something that is irreversible, because it is not. On the contrary, the struggle for freedom and democracy is an ongoing process, and these are values to be constantly protected, together with the rules and law and alliances that increasingly seem to no longer matter the way they used to. But they are important, and we must stick to them. We on both sides of the Atlantic. 30 years is a long time. There is a new and younger generation that was born after 89. They have no memories of it, and the Velvet Revolution seems as distant to them as 1968 seems to me. Perhaps it is partly also here from when the problems of freedom and democracy in Central Europe stem from today. This is a generation that has not lived under communism, who does not even hear about it anymore. The values of freedom and democracy are something they take for granted. They never missed them, and they never had to fight to achieve them. The young generation of today cannot imagine what it was like to stand in long queues at the borders when you wanted to travel, let alone not being allowed to cross the borders. 
On one hand, that is good, and it is something to be grateful for. On the other hand, however, it is dangerous in some ways that they do not have this experience and they do not learn about it. Because the young generation has not learned to be vigilant of those who want to tear apart the system that we have. Young people, especially the young people, are vulnerable to influence by various anti-system narratives, hoax and fake news that are spread limitlessly in the spaces of internet and social networks. And it is mainly the young people who are the mo most threatened by the totalitarian ideas of nowadays that in reality are nothing but the old ones dressed in new clothes. Unfortunately, this is one of the reasons why extreme right populists have the highest support within the young generation. And this is also why nationalism, extremism and populism are so successful in Central Europe. <coughs> it is these forces that are benefiting from the support of the Kremlin whether technological or personal or financial one. Here is where the enemies of the West have identified its Achilles heel and are working relentlessly to undermine the unity and stability of the free world. Being well aware of our economic and military strength, the enemies of our freedom and unity have found new ways. They are using to the fullest the tools of hybrid war, of undermining the democratic order from within, in Europe as well as in the US. They are abusing the frustration of part of societies to dismantle the system that enabled us on the old continent to live for 70 years in peace and prosperity. And as we can see in recent years, even in the US where democracy has a 250 year old tradition, people are not completely immune to these new types of threats. I was only four years old back in 89, so I only have blurry recollections of those times. But as the time passes, and as I closely follow the developments in the world around, it makes me often think about freedom and democracy, about their value back then, but mostly now when it is increasingly clear that democracy is not necessarily forever. There is no guidebook for democracy and no one teaches you how to manage it. We in Slovakia, for instance, had to learn from our own mistakes. The era of Vladimir Mečiar, when Slovakia became the black hole of Europe, as Mrs. Madeleine Albright has put it, was the first lesson in how the freedom and democracy can be misused and mistreated. Yet, as Slovakia managed to get rid of Mečiar's legacy in 98, we took on a speedy race to close the gap on our neighbors already in the process of joining the EU and NATO. Quickly, we managed to succeed in finalizing the economical transformation and became a transition success story. Today, looking at where we have come over those 30 years, I'm of two minds about it. On one hand, there are influences and dangers ahead that we haven't dreamt about it until quite recently. The hybrid war, extremism, various efforts to pull apart the system rather than make it better and stronger. <coughs> this is a disease spreading through the Western world and Europe, and it did not avoid us either. And just like with any disease, the healthier the organism, the greater are the chances to resist it. Unfortunately, the great speed of economic transition was just too painful for certain groups of people who, for various reasons, were unable to cope with the transformation and came to feel like the losers of the whole process. They were feeling betrayed by the promises of a better life that they never actually experienced. It would have been our duty to come back and support those people, but we failed and let them down. The governments that promised to do so, ending up creating parallel structures <coughs> for themselves and quickly forgot about their promises to the common people. Corruption, malfunctioning justice system and the influence of oligarchs all added up to the frustration of the people. And frustration, disappointment and the feeling of betrayal are fertile ground for breeding extremism. On the other hand, I have to confess that I am grateful to Slovaks for not letting democracy be taken away from them and for their willingness to fight for it, so different from what we are experiencing in our immediate neighborhood to the south and to the north. Slovakia is currently going through a healing process, and Slovaks clearly show 
that they will not put their values at risk. They have demonstrated in the massive and peaceful protests for decent Slovakia around the country. They have shown it in the recent presidential and European elections. Slovakia is maintaining its freedom of press and a healthy civil society. All these things give me hope that this is a fight that we can win. There can be pitfalls, detours and missteps, but we have set out on a road that is clearly signed by the democratic principles and freedoms. Some will always be suspicious of the motives of the people protesting. They will question their motivation, suggesting that the protest must be led from outside, financed by foreign organizations and governments. I believe that despite the disinformation campaigns, authenticity, community-spirited engagement, grassroots movements, and decency are the key components in a current day and future fight for freedom, and that only through these we can prevail. It makes little sense to talk about Slovakia without discussing the wider region of Central Europe, especially the countries of the so-called Visegrad group. Historically, this region has always been a sensitive geopolitical spot. The interests of great states and empires intersected here. It has never been stable, it has never been truly calm. It was for this reason that the ideas about setting new and fresh relationships with neighbors appeared still in the way of excitement shortly after the 89 revolution. One of the most positive outcomes of these discussions had been the creation of the so-called V3, a format of cooperation between Central European countries, soon replaced by V4 after the splitting of Czechoslovakia. This was something the region had never seen before. Also, there was a clear engagement agreement on joining forces in order to set a European path for the countries striving for peace and prosperity that only the membership in Euro-Atlantic structures could guarantee. Compared to what was happening in the decaying Soviet Union or Yugoslavia at the time, this was close to a miracle. When the alliance was created in the castle of Visegrad beside the Danube River on February 15, 1991, by the presidents of Poland, Czechoslovakia and Hungary, they set a clear goal. The Visegrad group was the expression of the efforts by the countries of Central Europe to cooperate on issues of common interest within the process of Euro-Atlantic integration. Czechoslovakia, Hungary and Poland have always been members of the same civilization based on similar cultural and intellectual values and common roots of religious traditions which they all pledged to sustain and support. All three, later four countries, were inspired to become EU and NATO members as they understood their integration into these structures as a next step forward in overcoming the artificial dividing lines in Europe <coughs> through cooperation. Sadly, I see less hope looking at the Visegrad region and some of its member states these days. It's paradox that this group originally created to assist better integration of its member states into the Euro-Atlantic structures, the group that was meant to strengthen the EU and to enhance European cooperation, today seems to be doing just the opposite. Openly renouncing the liberal democracy and replacing it with an illiberal one, restricting freedom of media, interfering with justice, increasing populism and nationalism, in Hungary, uh, even going as far as the revisionist tendencies of Trianon with the 100th anniversary of the treaty approaching. Some of the Visegrad leaders are attempting to transform the agreement from a tool that supports freedom and democracy into one that will enforce some new form of democracy that is not a real democracy anymore. One of the main targets of their actions is the EU a partnership we all, all fought hard to become members of after 1989. Their narratives are increasingly infused with creating the division between us and them, blaming all the bad on the EU, the greatest challenge being to defy the so-called Brussels dictate. Sadly, all of this leads to a new divide between East and West, between old and new member states, painfully remindful of the Iron Curtain. And this is exactly where the creators of hybrid war want us to be. Nationalism instead of cooperation, 
division instead of unity, scattered individual players following their own interests instead of one strong, solid block. Despite its many flaws, and I'm aware that all societies have some, the European Union proved to be the best cure against nationalism, causing conflicts in this region. It is absolutely unacceptable for myself and for all politicians and voters strongly believing in the European path to join the fight with imaginary enemies from Paris, Brussels, Berlin or Washington. Warriors like Viktor Orban will continue to seek alliances with other nationalists across Europe and it is our duty to remind them and to remind the world that nationalism has never been an answer to any problem. <coughs> On the contrary, just in the last century, it sparked two world wars with tens of millions of victims. In the interest of the future of the <coughs> EU, we cannot be dragged by those who attempt to fight a new Cold War. We cannot be dragged by nationalistic egoism, destroying the common European and Euro-Atlantic project. We need to be supporting further strengthening of our institutions, of the EU and NATO, and searching for joint solutions, not the destructive tendencies within. How we will succeed in doing that is what will matter the most in the years to come. Those refusing cooperation generally do not represent any meaningful alternative. They are riding on a wave of popularity but have no plan and often not even the slightest vision of what we would do once we are on our own. We saw how quickly the loudest advocates of Brexit dispersed. We politicians, but also we societies, need to take a more responsible stance in these times, when we are witnessing a whole range of disruptive trends, questioning our membership in NATO and EU, as well as our democratic values. New information channels, especially so-called alternative media, and social networks are often abused to these ends. These are phenomena with the capacity to dismantle our society, the EU and existing alliances, as well as the democratic world. Our duty is to face them and to fight back by all means and tools that the West has at its disposal. Europe and the US are intertwined like communicating vessels on both sides of the Atlantic. And it has become evident that even old established democracies like the US are not immune to the threats to democracy, to temptations of isolationism and populism. What we can see from the outside, from our side of the Atlantic, is that America cannot be great if it shuts itself off and withdraws from cooperation. Cooperation is indispensable especially in today's interdependent world. We will do the best for freedom and democracy by standing together in times when the value basis on either side of the Atlantic is at risk. It was cooperation between US and Europe that brought 70 years of peace to the European continent. Therefore, seeing that the fight for democracy is not over, the biggest challenge for the future is to preserve the democracy and freedom that we have on both sides of the Atlantic. And this is something that we can only succeed in by joining forces. Today, instead of putting our, at risk our cooperation within NATO by controversial statements <coughs> and seeing one another as competitors, introducing new tariffs and trade barriers, we should go back to the reason wh why we started cooperating in the first place. It is our common values that bind us freedom and democracy. And the only way to preserve them is cooperation, one that needs to go beyond the immediate benefit of the transaction. If after World War II, Americans would have been looking at the cost of the Marshall Plan and the reconstruction of Germany through an America first optics, where would we both be today? History has showed us that the transatlantic cooperation has been beneficial for both sides in many ways, whether it was defense cooperation that provided for 70 years of peace in NATO member states, which is of particular value in Europe that has been caught in constant conflict for centuries before, or economic cooperation that provided for relative prosperity on both sides of the Atlantic. Mutual investment, taking down barriers, exchanges in goods, students, professionals, and experience, 
made stronger both Europe and the U.S. We share values, allies, and goals. The transatlantic bilateral trade has been and will remain a central artillery of the world economy. Our mutual cooperation is for the best. We have common interests and challenges, whether it is Ukraine, the Western Balkans, the Middle East, the fight against terrorism, or the vulnerabilities related to the spread of disinformation and cyber attacks. We should remember that together we are stronger and we can make a difference. Becoming competitors, on the other hand, would make us both weaker, especially in the current global playing field. It would only play into the hands of other, more hostile actors. Today, more than ever in recent years, we are facing challenges and threats that would not even seem real not so long ago. We have found ourselves in a situation where the essence, one of the pillars of Western civilization, is at risk. We thought that democracy was the end of history and that it was a system from which it's impossible to backslide. But the recent developments in Europe, US, and elsewhere in the world are showing us that it is not as unimaginable as we thought. Therefore, the biggest challenge for all of us will be to defend our values and to preserve freedom and democracy for our children and future generations. The first step on that way is to realize the threats. At the same time, it is equally important to acknowledge that freedom and democracy are not thriving in isolation, and that is why we must enforce them together by means of cooperation. For freedom and democracy are incomplete when the third element is missing, cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me for one last thought. Symbolically, this year, 2019, that marks the 30th anniversary of our own victory in the fight for freedom, seems to be the year of a fight for freedom, democracy, and prosperity in many regions of the world. People from Hong Kong through the Middle East to Latin America are taking to the streets to stand up for the same values that we in Central and Eastern Europe fought for 30 years ago. If there is something that we learned during these last 30 years, it is that the change towards freedom and democracy has helped not only us directly concerned in Central Europe, but the enlargement of the democratic space has benefited us all. That is why we should not resign from a common effort to further enlarge the space of freedom and democracy. In the short term, it would mean supporting people in the countries concerned. But in the long run, we are helping all of us towards a stable, predictable world with a rule-based order. Thank you for your attention. I now would like to invite uh, Ambassador Komnichek to come up and introduce uh, Shimon Panik. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce today the Czech speaker for the Freedom Lecture, Shimon Panek. Obviously, on the 30th anniversary of the Velvet Revolution, we were thinking whom to bring for you. And at the end, we decided that it should be one of the faces of the Velvet Revolution. Shimon actually came into prominence even before, in 1988, he was one of the co-founders uh, of the humanitarian relief help for Armenia and after the tragic earthquake there. And in 1989, he became the voice and the face of the Czech student movement, which was actually the main force which brought down communism in that time, Czechoslovakia. Uh, Shimon has traditionally interesting feelings towards the political arena because actually he twice almost ended as a member of the Czech parliament. First time he was co-opted and refused to become a politician. Uh, second time he was elected from the 13th uh, place uh, because of the preferential voice and resigned in like, I think, two weeks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so instead of going to politics, uh, as almost everybody of us expected, he came totally different way. 
He established people in need, uh, the biggest center, a, a European uh, NGO and a foundation which brings relief, humanitarian help and hopes, ho helps people all around the world. And it's still the biggest and most growing NGO in our part of the world. So that basically means that he keeps the original spirit of the revolution alive, which also keeps him still young. With that, of, let me offer you a taste of Shimon Palmek. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. You surprise me most of the time, so... Uh, <coughs> but be careful, you know, it can happen vice versa as well today. Uh, we had a chance to hear f the great stateswoman speech of Katarina. Unfortunately, she covered most of the things which I got in mind. And we didn't compare the speeches before. So I have to partially improvise. Uh, anyway, my idea was to share with you a little bit more of a direct uh, atmospheres, uh, values, reasons, uh, decisions which we made at that time and which are still valid in, in many ways. I would like to thank, uh, of course, the mm, Friends of Czech Republic, Friends of Slovakia, uh, Distinguished Ambassadors and the Wilson Center to be invited. It's an honor for me. Uh, I did not expect, and if I, if I look to the row of the speakers here, Madam Secretary uh, Albright, uh, mm, Professor Halik and all others, well, I think I should wait another 10, 20 years to be invited here, but okay. Um, what was important for us as a students, uh, and we were just few of us in the beginning, was that we realized in 88 and 89, you are probably aware that the first unofficial uh, anti-regime demonstration happened on 21st August 1989, on the 20th anniversary of the invasion of the uh, Soviet uh, and Warsaw Pact Army. So it took 19 years between 1989, uh, 1969 and 1988, 19 years of fear before people uh, got enough courage to go to the streets. Just imagine how well they managed the country through the fear. Uh, and it didn't happen just within, without having uh, Gorbachev in uh, Kremlin, who was probably partially persuaded by Ronald Reagan, uh, Margaret Thatcher, Helmut Kohl, that the uh, time is changing, that the Soviet Union probably would not be able anymore to compete economically, nor in a coming IT era. The Gorbachev could still try to hold the things in a similar way as the previous Soviet leaders. You remember probably Leonid Brezhnev, who was there for... 25 years, they were trying to hold the things without basically changing. And Gorbachev decided, and I think that was the key moment for the slow, I would not say liberalization, but slow changes of the atmosphere and decreasing of the fear in Eastern Europe, that he's starting perestroika. A kind of a rebuilding or improvement, improvement in a limited uh, frame, of course, of the of the communist uh, economy, but also communist uh, um, functions of the society of Soviet Union. And he sent his personal envoy in 1986 to visit all communist leaders in the Central Eastern Europe. We were not aware of of that, of course, because there were no. Uh, independent press, everything was under the control, most of the important things were done through the special secret envoys. And the message of that uh, Alexander Yakovlev, the member of the Politburo, the central uh, managing committee of the Soviet Communist Party was, we are starting to change. You should do the same. If not, don't expect that we will back you anymore. And some countries started, like Hungarians, uh, they were quite creative and they came with the so-called goulash communism, uh, keeping some of the 
some of the surface similar as in other places, but allowing uh, a private business. There were uh, private banks registered beginning of 89 in Hungary, which is surprising. In Czech Republic, we had no a single pub, which was uh, private before the November 89. So the differences were big. Poland, we are all aware, and the Poles were always much more brave than the Czechoslovaks, I would say. They were fighting already for 10 years through Solidarność while we were waiting. That's the habit. The Czechs always wait. Sometimes 300 years, sometimes 25 years, sometimes uh, 40 years, you know. Depends <clears throat> how they feel and what's happening around. So, uh, And I went to the demonstration. I was 21 years old, uh, student of the biology faculty of Charles University. My background, my, my father was 11 years in 50s in Stalin uh, labor camps and in the prison when he ran away from a uranium labor camp. My stepfather was a part of the Charter 77 structure, so I was quite uh, well-oriented. What does it mean <laughs> to live in communism? But I was in the same time allowed to study because, you know, the flowers and the bugs were not um, the main focus of the communist um, ideologist. And at the end of the 80s, it was relatively... Um, easier than in 70s. So they allowed me to study. Uh, the natural science faculty had quite interesting, relatively open atmosphere. We were meeting some of the professors on the anti-regime demonstration. So it was encouraging. But in the same time, it was surprising that very few students came to the, such demonstrations in 88 and 89. I would say 10%. The rest were people connected with the dissidents, with a really brave uh, and specific, I would say, part of the society. How many of them were in Czechoslovakia? A few thousand compared to 15 million. I was not a part of that. I, I, I had no courage uh, to join the hard dissident movement. And it even didn't came to my mind. I was living my life as a student. I went to the demonstration. I was distributing a little bit of some leaflets, uh, visiting the library and putting them between the books, you know, hoping that someone will find them uh, and it will be a moment of enlightenment, uh, including in eastern Slovakia. We went there to uh, trek on the mountains and then when we, when we got down, we were visiting the Slovak libraries and putting the leaflets there. Um, and... Then it came to our mind, and there were few, few people, uh, some colleagues from a dissident, families like Martin and Marek Benda, Jiří Dinsbír uh, Jr., or Ivan Klima the, uh, from a broader Klima family. I was not uh, no name, but it happened by coincidence in the in our kitchen because uh, our parents were supporting it, and and after we were usually quite scary running away from the docks and the special police. We were meeting in one of the homes and in a so-called Palach week in uh, January 1989, we got once in our uh, kitchen, uh, my mother making a hot tea for everyone and, and um, uh, young Klima, the, um, uh, the, the, the cousin or the from a Klima's family proposed, hey guys, we have to start organize the students because that's a shame that there are no students at the demonstrations. And that was the beginning of our structure, which was called Stuha, means ribbon, but also studentske hnutí in Czech, student movement. And in summer 89, there were only 45 people from 20 different Prague faculties, so significant mobilizing network. We, of course, had some issues regarding logistics and security because if 45 people met during the communism, it was immediately uh, followed by the secret police and also from the flat is difficult to run away. Usually you have on only one entrance. So finally Stuha was meeting in the Prague parks. Uh, we were meeting in a Prague parks because from a park you can run at least to the four different uh, uh, directions. Um, and the idea of Stuha, the first um, substantial idea was let's make our own student demonstration or manifestation on an international day of uh, students uh, which is 17 November, the anniversary of the murder of uh, Jan Opletal by the Nazis in 1939. The idea was that it would be difficult for communists to say no if we come with this date. 
and it worked. Uh, instead of them, that they approached us 10 days before 17 November 89 with the offer. If you will allow the youth communist representative to speak at Alberto, which is an academic part of the Prague, we will uh, obtain the official permission for student manifestation. <coughs> then the st battle between the idealists and pragmatists among our Stuha started. The uh, idealists say, with evil, nothing. Uh, let's not make alliance. I was among the pragmatists saying, if it will be uh, permitted, we will get much more people there. And it happened. So compared to other demonstrations, where usually three, four, five thousand people came, 17th of November was 40,000 people. 30 to 40,000 people, which was completely different energy. Plus, and that we learned only after, uh, there were no dissidents, uh, just as students, professors, ordinary people. Not by coincidence, because Václav Havel had a meeting with other uh, leaders of a dissident movement a week before, and he, with all this authority, persuaded them not to go and join it with the idea, let the students to do it on their own which was a genius uh, decision, because otherwise the communist propaganda would probably use again the same rhetorics. You see, they are misleaded, Havel, who is paid from abroad, and, you know, other people. It didn't happen, so for the propaganda, it was very difficult to portray the demonstration as a one in the row. Instead of that, uh, the reading of what happened on 17 November by the generation of my parents was, they are beating our kids. And that was the last moment, last last drop to the to the uh, glass, which started basically emotional reaction and emotional eruption. And the people just uh, decide to go out of the streets. And in the f in few days, it was clear that it's basically irreversible. It was not clear how it will f be finished. And uh, we are often asked, was it revolution or was it kind of a change of the regime? Was it confrontation or dialogue? It was both. In the beginning, it was very confrontational. We were really scared. On the second day of strike, which was 21st November, there were thousands and thousands of special, they call it militia. It was a special armed fist of the Communist Party, they call it. The, the, the workers who have the rifles, and they were concentrated to Prague from afar provinces, not from Prague factories, because the Prague people had the kids in the demonstration and, and they were part of the Prague basically movement. So they took them from 150, 200 kilometers away, small towns and, and, and uh, provinces. And we were really scared. And we sent two special envoys that evening, one to US embassy and one to the Soviet embassy. At the U.S. Embassy, they did not allow him inside because they were completely in chaos what's happening, to be honest. In Soviet Embassy, at 1 a.m., uh, a high political uh, diplomat received my personal colleague from uh, Natural Science Faculty, and he gave basically a uh, simple message. Uh, Mr. Gorbachev don't want to, have to, have to see any bloodshed in the Czech Republic. And it was so important for us, uh, for the students, that Gorbachev is aware of what's happening and it's against the violence. And that relieved very much our feeling. Um, the Central uh, Committee of Communist Party uh, stood down in three, four days after and uh, they, they were still playing kind of a position game, trying to offer a mixed communist and uh, uh, opposition government. But then in one moment, and I must say that they, that they were tactically quite advanced, they took down all the 70, 80 years old communist leaders and they offered the younger generation, people in their 40s, 50s, uh, and, and, and they made a simple op offer saying to Václav Havel, and I was a part of the Václav Havel's personal team who negotiated with the Communist Party, so I was present when the offer was made. And the offer was, Mr. Havel, let's agree. And you can't, you know, sit, especially if you are a liberal, intellectual, writer, peaceful person, and have a negotiations with someone, and in the same time, continue with the... Uh, tough confrontation. 
if you sit around the table, you are not anymore enemies. You are the partners in the dialogue. And they succeeded, basically. And it probably helped them later on to got, if not, it, it was not amnesty, but it was a very soft approach of a new state, new elite towards the communism and towards the past, which I was part of that as well. I feel also that we should be generous. We are the winners. Why to, you know, spend the time with that uh, losers who basically lost and they are they are going to the garbage pit of the history. Uh, but I think it was wrong because instead of really staying stick to the justice and to naming the things with the right names, we just kind of you know, forget about that with a very few examples. And it was one of the reasons why uh, feeling what's justice and what's not justice, what's right, what's wrong. It's sometimes a, a bit mixed picture these days in Central Europe still. Let me to jump to the uh, 90s and to the uh, to the heritage of 89. Uh, I think we made a crucial mistake, at least uh, myself. Uh, one should start from himself first. I My feeling was that with the, with the fall of the communism, basically everything important is finished. The communists uh, lost, they will, you know, disappear. The people on power, both political and economical power, will decide for the good, not for the own good, but for the public good. Unfortunately, a lot of them decide for their own good. Uh, and uh, my father, who was 62 at the time, was much less idealistic, saying, my dear son, it's great. I never expected that the communism will collapse in my life. He was in prison when he was 19 in 1949. So mm, he spent most of the life, good part in the prison and uh, the rest of the f uh, life under the communist. I'm extremely happy. I still have another 10, 15 years. I'm happy that you, my son, were part of that. But it will take at least two generations. Because the people who lie will lie. The people who uh, were not moral will not be any more moral. Uh, you can change the rules. You can start to build, build a new country, but the ethics of the people will be same. And unfortunately, he was right. And that's the reason why the Central Europe is still struggling. Um, also, we had very little experience with the, with the democracy, freedom and free market. The communists did not allow us to travel to the West, so our feeling was that the freedom and the free market is enough. And uh, we knew, well, in the US it's slightly different, but at least in Europe, under the basic uh, frame or between the frames of freedom and free market, you have so much rule of law, regulations, legislation, um, delegation of money, solidarity, culture, and we were not aware about uh, so also the you know human nature is that from a very tight society it moved to extreme liberalism i would say almost stupid liberalism we wanted to liberalize everything up to the maximum but it doesn't work it doesn't work especially for a weaker part of the society for minorities for roma people for those who were not enough strong to make fortune from a new free, free market economy and there is a good part of them in both our countries and all of them feel as a losers now so the state basically absent uh, they're absent into the regulation and 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 enough uh, matured care uh, of the fact that if if the democracy, freedom and free market uh, supposed to be successful, it should uh, serve for the most of the people in the country, for maximum of the people in the country. And it requires a lot of the work of the state and state systems. Well, U.S. society is in structure slightly different, but in Europe uh, it was a fa failure, unfortunately. And uh, uh, we made some promises each to other in 89, and part of that promises were truth, solidarity, respect to each other, humanism, human rights, self-confidence, and in the same time, humbleness, decency, and optimism. Uh, it was very important. Now, 30 years, 30 years later, Central Europe is struggling with the similar uh, issues as the rest of the West. Uh, the reasons are 
probably for a specific lecture uh, and for the someone who is able to think the things uh, much more true than myself i am just you know operational manager of uh, ngo which is trying to fix some of the things which are not working but um, part of the reason why we are struggling where there is a certain anxiety or almost fear from the future uh, among a lot of people it's definitely the speed speed of the technological changes informational technologies up to the artificial intelligence uh, the things are changing more quickly than ever probably the second reason is the end of the euro american domination or anglo american domination in the past i'm sorry but uh, we were dominating the world for the last 200 years and it's changing the world is now more multipolar than than it was and we have to get adjust to that and I think a lot of people feel really uncertain about the future. And that's the good soil for the populists coming with the simplified messages. Yes, I return you back to good old times, good old uh, Britain, or I'll make sure that everything is as it was 20 years ago. Uh, of course, it won't be because uh, we are not able to stop the time, neither globalization, not this era of the changes in the world and we all have to as a liberal elites we have to think about how to adjust our messages how to be more open to the most of the people how to fix some of the things which we made during the last 20 30 years without that i think we at least for the moment we are not offering enough interesting uh, and enough strong uh scenarios and visions to the lot of the people and the populists see the czech republic or slovakia central europe some other parts of the world uh, where the populists are at least in the last five six eight years gaining more and more support um it looks like that we are sometimes losing the direction or losing simple instincts uh, what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's lie, which is surprising because 30 years ago we had a feeling that these things are so crystal clear and that they are basically mm, for granted forever. Uh, but with the fake news, with the manipulation, uh, with the, all this information in the cyber space, uh, it's getting to be more difficult, of course. And uh, I fully agree that with the populism and nationalism, with the kind of a opening the Pandora boxes and releasing uh, the ghosts of the national sovereign, national strength and national interests, we won't get far. Uh, the world is really changing and uh, authoritarians and dictators are quickly learning one from each other. You probably know that the last 10 years uh, uh, they're not very good for the democracy around the globe, uh, vice versa. Authoritarians are scoring uh, in a lot of the parts of the world. It's not because the democracy and freedom is uh, less important, but it's because they are really enjoying the globalization of the lot of the things, including the control over the civil society, control of media, um, different laws which try to cut civil society from the support from abroad, criminalization of activists and opponents through economical criminality, but more and more even through the laws which uh, misused anti-terrorist or anti-extremist uh, paragraphs again, against the activists in some part of the, of the world. And um, if we want to restore our position globally, and I think... Mm, permit me that because we work in 20 countries a lot of them are authoritarian countries uh, uh, countries where the freedom and democracy is not really um, uh, it's not really <clears throat> managing what's happening if we want to be again the role model for the lot of uh, countries and especially millions of people who genuinely fight for the same things for which we fought in 89. It means for truth, transparency, respect, humbleness, solidarity, 
uh, democracy, freedom for human rights. We have to also, as a liberal elites, uh, do something uh, home. And I think each of us could start uh, uh, with the uh, own environment around uh, to fight against disinformation. Every one of us can use half an hour on Facebook every second day and try to counter speech, uh, the lies and other things which are happening there. Every one of us uh, could try to get back time to time uh, to our, I would say, idealism which drove us when we started our businesses, universities, schools, or uh, smaller or bigger non-profit organizations, or the idealism which drove the young people, students in the most of the countries of Central Europe to go against the communist dictatorships. Same idealism which drove young uh, Ukrainians five years ago or five and a half, six years ago now at Maidan to go against the uh, captured state and against the corruption and clientelism. Same uh, genuine uh, genuine will or struggle uh, for freedom and democracy, which basically uh, energizing the young people uh, around the globe. Let me to let me to uh, try to summarize by the uh, sometimes theoretically but very practical question: uh, Is it success what happens in the Central and Eastern Europe? I think for Central Europe, definitely yes. Uh, no, it would be naive to expect that the things goes just linear, linear, and they are better and better and better and better. Up and downs, it's a part of the cycle and of the life. And of course, subjectively, I am as a student leader who was at that time 22 years old, uh, naive and full of idealism. I am sometimes not feeling very good uh, if I have a look around the Central Europe. But then if I try, and it's a subjective feeling, it very much depends uh, how well you sleep uh, that day. Uh, but if you try to compare it and to do a bit of analysis, and I'm a scientist, so that's the, another part of my heart, and I put the former Soviet Union countries, I put the Balkans, I put the Central Europe, I put uh, Burma, Myanmar, the Arab countries, I put on the same kind of a scale so many countries which got rid of the dictators and authoritarian regimes during the last 30 years, only few of them really succeeded. Uh, and it's not because we are better, but we had a much, <coughs> much better starting point in Central Eastern Europe compared to uh, countries, most of the countries of the former Soviet Union, not talking about the other parts of the world. So let me to conclude with a... With a it's a simple thing, and we all know it, but I think it's extremely important to re repeat it again and again, uh, that to build the free, democratic, fair society after the years of authoritarian regime or dictatorship is much more difficult than anyone expects. And uh, if we have to distill one thing from the values of 89, and that's why I work uh, in the NGO which helps other places around the globe, that our moral duty is to continue home, but also abroad, uh, because with all the problems, mistakes, up and downs, backslashes, there is n definitely not better uh, type of the state system than the liberal democracy because this is it's something which offer high individual freedom human rights space to fight for the values uh, and i think we should remain it uh, again and again to each to other because uh, in a period when a lot of the populists are trying to come with the idea of liberal democracies of some type of a new options it's extremely dangerous, uh, and uh, I think the uh, message from Europe, Anus Mirabilis 89 in Central Eastern Europe is still alive. Uh, it's a role model for the lot of activists around the globe, and I think we should um, just uh, uh, understand that it's more work than we expected to proceed uh, into the future. Thank you.
I'm struck by the continuity between um, your remarks and um, also by how valuable your perspective is um, for how we think about not just 1989 but the present and not just in Central Europe but here and many other places. Um, you both see democracy as a project, as a process, not a final outcome or box to be checked. Democracy, as you've described it, is a verb, it's not a noun. And I think that that's a very important lesson because uh, we have tended to think that, well, communists has fallen, we have elections, box checked, everything's fine, we have a democracy now. But you also both touch on a moral dimension to what democracy is about, a dimension that sometimes is overlooked. Katerina, you spoke a lot about decency. Shimon, you spoke about respect, about um, the values of 1989. And what struck me is, um, I think you're absolutely right. I think decency was a big part of the 1989 story and even the 1991 story in the Soviet Union. Uh, we tend to have forgotten that, but there was a, a search for, I mean, my Russian friends would say, we want to live normally. Well, what they meant was they wanted to live a decent life. And this moral element of the process has often been overlooked. So if we view <coughs> democracy as a process, an ongoing process, an ongoing challenge, uh, and we want to move past just blaming the, the nationalists and the populists, what are the sources now of the core decency and respect that you've been talking about? <coughs> Where should we look for those values, that moral clarity now? Thank you. It's not easy question at all. Uh, but uh, well, let me too, uh, because I'm not scholar. So let me to help myself with um, uh, one of the, um, in my opinion, most interesting thinkers uh, about Central Eastern Europe, and it's Timothy Snyder. Uh, he just published a, a year ago a, a small book, Twenty Lections uh, or Classes uh, for the Twenty First Century Against the Tyranny. And one of the uh, uh, lessons is don't read internet, read the books. Uh, because in the books, especially in the classical books, uh, in, the, in, in, in a big classical books, you, you find the values. The people were fighting and dying for the values. Uh, compare, you know, to the kind of a tide of the internet where the things are getting quite moot and unclear. If you return to, at least, it's, it's of course allegory, but we have a very old, very long history where the people were dying for the values. Uh, so I think it's the right time, if we are lost in, the, in, the, in, in these days, to return sometimes to the examples of our fathers and their fathers and the fathers of the United States and, uh, and Tomasz Garik Masaryk and Stefanik in case of Czechoslovakia uh, or to Václav Havel and to the thinkers. I think there is a lot what we, what we can build on these days and what can help us to get better oriented, to get back on the right track. Uh, I was in the beginning of this year at the funeral of the one very well-known Czech, uh, Czech uh, writer and political prisoner, Jerzy Stransky. He was also a lifetime scout. So the scouts organized the funeral in the Prague Castle. And for ma myself, it was uh, one of the aha moments. Yes, he spent 90 years or 70 years out of his life fighting for the values. He was imprisoned three times. Uh, and he never gave up. Who we are facing, you know, little bit of propaganda on internet now and being blamed and shamed through Facebook, and 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 we are sometimes feeling that we should adjust what we do, or maybe 
you know, move some of the things. No, I think we should return to the uh, traditional values. And, and I think especially the generations before, uh, it's a great example because they were really, you know, losing their lives for the values. I agree a lot. I'm, I'm also a big fan of Timothy Snyder, uh, but I agree more on, on uh, even more on the part that we should look into our own values that we had in history. And it is true that we are, it is a continuous process and we are continuing in building and making better our democracies. We are creating new institutions. We are improving constantly our laws to be bulletproof to corruption. Yeah, but yeah. still there are, you know, people who sure. find the ways through and, and around the, the institutions uh, and justice system and, and businesses. And, you know, they find their ways to cheat somehow. And a big paradox is that, especially now in Europe, uh, since the migration crisis, the refugee crisis, that we were facing a couple of years ago. Um, politicians and people a lot spoke about our Christian values that we want to defend. And it is our Christian values that we need to protect from those villains and those people who are so different from us. And, and it was such a paradox because if we are really Christian and if we look into our Christian values, it is love and help and solidarity and decency and all these values that we should, you know, be helping those people. And, and it is, I think it is very true that it's enough to look into our history and into our values that we believe that are the core of our culture and religion. And the answer is there. Thank you. Okay, we're going to open it up. We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, let me get a sense of the room. Okay, uh, we'll take the gentleman here and then the gentleman behind him. Uh, maybe we'll take both questions and come up so we can squeeze more in. This gentleman right here. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jan Zdralek. I am a student here at the Johns Hopkins University. And I'm Czech, disclosure. Um, so I have two comments. First, uh, thank you, Mr. Panik, for your work during the Velvet Revolution. I really appreciate that. I know you played it down a little bit, but let me just say... Oh, it was a fun. Edit. Right, right. Um, <laughs> secondly, I want to say I'm sorry for people in need being put on a blacklist, sort of, in Russia two days ago. Sorry about that. I uh, em empathize with you. And thirdly, I have a question. Sort of, You talked about it a little bit. Um, question for both of you. So I am, you know, I. you were sort of my age in 1989 you were doing a revolution now we have democracy and it's it's much harder to change things if we don't like them the way they are and it's really difficult to um fight for democracy when we actually have it but it's maybe you know go getting into a place where we where we don't like it to be um so should i go into politics you know what <laughs> It's, this is really difficult, I have to say, you know, um, so this is maybe a question for uh, Ms. Cefalovanova actually as well. So how do I proceed? Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to spend half an hour on Facebook each day, you know, to kind of like um, telling people, oh, this is actually a hoax. You shouldn't like, you know, spread this around. So um, I guess my question is, what kind of advice or, or would you give to a person like me? Why don't we go ahead and answer and then we'll come to this gentleman. Go ahead. Uh, well, it's great to see. We'll, we'll have them answer okay. first. Oh, sorry. It's great to see students from our region here at such a good university, and it, it's a proof of our also the, the cooperation and and you know the the um, the importance of us sticking together. And and it's very very I love to see you know as as an academic as a teacher university teacher to see uh, bright brilliant uh, young people uh, going abroad and, and not to not to be afraid of the challenge and and then i hope you'll come back uh, to serve your country and and our um, our common that's the plan <laughs> great um, i would love 
for people like you to come into politics. If you are uh, asking this question, I think we need enlightened, uh, educated people uh, and anyone who, who sees any any benefit for the society and not for themselves in going into politics. So I would encourage you to do so. But um, I think Shimon provided uh, a very good recipe of how we can you know, contribute. It's 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 to start in our own environment, uh, in in our own family, and and between friends and on Facebook and so on. But I would like to comment on what she said that it was easier back then, and it seems so hard now. I think it seems easier from the retrospect because it has been a success story. But I think Shimon was 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 risking his life in a way because yes, because we. we I think you didn't know what it could be Tianmen. You didn't know when you started. The checks are, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, the way it, it it went well, we are we are downplaying a little, but it was a huge challenge, and it's it's much easier to improve democracy once we have it uh, than to to go from an authoritarian regime to a democratic one. And I'm, I'm glad you are willing to, and I encourage you to. It's a part of the democracy that the things go down. It's not the first time you see what was happening here in whatever, during McCarthyism, for example, or even in Europe during different periods. And I think first thing is not to see it as a as an end of the history uh, or end of democracy. Well, case of Hungary is difficult because once the, you know, leader got um, the the waste majority then it's difficult but in the rest of the central europe it's still open process and i think there is a lot of the promising positive um, energy coming from slovakia uh, unfortunately it it basically was based or started by the tragic murder of the two young people but it's possible as we can see uh, and it's not just the president, but even the you know head of the foreign committee looks that is oriented well, you know, <coughs> in terms of politics and direction. Uh, so I think it's not lost, uh, and uh, and I am, and and I am one of few from civil society who's, for example, open to meet the Czech Prime Minister, which others see as an evil. And I my my answer to that is well, that's the democracy. He was elected. So I fully agree with the Czech demonstrations organized by young people where we had almost 300 people in summer. But in the same time, I understand him saying, well, okay, that's that's your right. That's your opinion. We are living in democracy. It was really big demonstration, but I was elected and I continue to manage the government. And that's a, that's a democracy, you know. So let's proceed and let, let's not think that it's the end of the... Uh, end of the whatever word uh, and um, I think you know it, it's not just that the populists in, in Hungary and partially Poland and Czech Republic are uh, uh, winning because they are so good it's also probably some homework on the side of liberal democrats uh, or Democrats uh, true Democrats because why we are not anymore or why that parties are anymore uh, not tempting what they why they are scoring so bad compared to to Babiš and Orban and Kaczynski uh, well there is a, some problem on the on our side also you know so uh, and to go to politics of course go to politics I don't want so you should at least okay. you know uh, okay this gentleman we're gonna have time for one or two other questions are there any other questions okay this will be the last question and we'll wrap up okay well, well, should I should I resign now? Or? No, no. You go ahead, and then I. I there's a woman behind you. Who I think I have a question. good follow-up question. I think education is the key for preserving democracy, really. Uh, and I would like uh, you to comment on that, especially modern history rather than starting with prehistory. <coughs> okay. Mm -hmm. And there's a woman right behind you. We'll get her question. Good afternoon, Sanjin Choi. Um, I, may I echo what you said? I think this is such a fitting place to discuss about Czechoslovakia, because after all, 
uh, future president of Czechoslovakia, um, Ma Thomas Masaryk, visited in Washington, D.C., October 1918, to discuss, negotiate uh, independence of Czechoslovakia. So mm -hmm. it is fitting place. And uh, Ms. Pastor, you mentioned about inspiration figure. As I pass through the statue of memorial statue at Thomas Masaryk at the embassy row, he is the person who was elected as President Czechoslovak three times and spent constantly occupied with setting the crisis between and Czech and Slovakia. So if he's here today in front of you, how would you say what happened, what went wrong, how you can improve? Thank you very much. Okay. Now, we can put another question if anybody has them. I, There are, is there a woman with a question? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, okay. Right here, and then we'll take. Here you go. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. I had led uh, a U.S. delegation to uh, Czechoslovakia in 1990 in helping to get things away from the communist regime and back to being a free market democracy. And I'm wondering what can be done to move things more toward the free market. Okay, we have three very different questions. Education, mm -hmm. uh, what you would say to Masaryk and the free market economy. <laughs> so um, education, I'm glad you asked about education. It was one of the topics that we discussed also yesterday at the conference that we had uh, at Georgetown University uh, on the topic of the legacy of, of 89. And one of the points, one of our common findings is that you're very right. Uh, the problem of the fragility of democracy in our societies and in our region right now is also due, and I may be biased as an academic, uh, because I think that it all comes down, all the problems eventually come down to education, uh, that, that it is uh, a fault in, in the lack of education of history. We are in, in schools in Slovakia, for example, I was in school not so long ago, uh, we were learning history from the beginning, you know, and at elementary school and then at, uh, at um, the middle school and university, we were taking, you know, three times the same and there was never enough time to be talking about the 20th century. Stone Age three times, but yes. the 20th <laughs> century no. And And we are, we are especially nowadays uh, again in Slovakia we have for the first time since uh, 2016 in the parliament an extreme right uh, political party so we are paying more attention to to emphasize the education on second world war uh, and on on the crimes of the Nazi regime but we are forgetting or not wanting to, perhaps because it's still the heritage and still some of the teachers are there from that, those times. We are not enough pointing out the similarities between the two, between the extreme right and the extreme left and the communism and the crimes of communist regime. And we are not at all teaching our young generation about uh, the fight for democracy, about the Velvet Revolution and its legacies. And this is, in my opinion, one of, one of the, the biggest mistakes that we are making uh, which then results in, in what I was talking about, people not being aware of and taking democracy for, uh, for granted, not being aware of, uh, of the values, of the value of the price uh, of democracy. And another thing, uh, if we're talking about disinformation and hybrid war uh, that Slovakia is uh, quite heavily targeted with, uh, it is again education and, and mainly 
family education that will help us uh, to to go through this. If we if we are emphasizing this at uh, to kids, but but mainly to to young people, uh, if we are emphasizing critical thinking, analytical skills, and and all of these, it again comes down to education, and again, uh, the best solution. To, to to this question as well, but to a variety of other questions, the Roma question, that is a, a looming question in Slovakia, also also in education. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Nothing to add. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's exactly what I think about the situation, <coughs> and and we really underestimate importance of the decommunization or de uh, of the society uh, i just learned a mm, few years ago that germany in the middle of the 50s decided that the uh, education in in tolerance democracy active citizenship that is a question of the national stability and since 1950s they have a special department at the ministry of home affairs which is funding different initiatives in germany to make sure that the citizens will be educated aware sensitive in central eastern europe the states didn't give a penny for the last 30 years in, in it's instead substituted by the NGOs different in Slovakia Pontis and others in Czech Republic people in it my NGO has the program which is called stories of injustice from the past and it's almost 3000 schools who used our materials uh, films lectures and other things but it's not enough it you can't substitute the state completely you know um With the rest, Masaryk, yeah, exactly. I think that was what I was saying. Uh, let's turn to the books. Let's turn to the fathers and fathers of the fathers. Masaryk uh, here, Jefferson uh, and, and other, others who really put the values and ethical principles very high. And I think they really can uh, be a, a kind of orientation or the, or the frame for what's happening now or the optics how to how to try to get orientation and free market i don't think so that we have any problem in slovakia neither in czech it's in a free uh, already <laughs> If I may add just, just one sentence to, to Masaryk, because I understood, I don't know if you meant the question, what happened between the Czechs and Slovaks. So uh, it was a political decision of, of the political elites. There has never been a referendum. So it, it is a painful point for some of us in, in our history. And uh, again, I, I was too young to, to have an opinion about that at the time, but I remember at New Year's, on New Year's Eve, that I was celebrating with my parents, I was uh, seven, eight years old, I remember them crying, tears rolling down their cheeks that we are losing our Czech brothers. And while others will ce were celebrating, Vladimir Meja was celebrating that we are finally uh, independent Slovakia in my home and, and in many homes, uh, it was more of a sadness. But um, To, to turn it to a more positive end. I think that we have found each other in uh, the EU and in, in the Euro-Atlantic structures where we both belong. And I am proud and happy that our nations are the best friends and closest allies and we have great relationship. And I think Tomasz Garik Masaryk himself would be proud of how well we are handling our, our relationship. Well, I think this... I think this event has a demonstration of, of, of that wonderful relationship. Are we having a little ceremony here? Yes, okay. If the people, please come up. Big ceremony. Big ceremony, okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Tom Dine. I'm president of the American Friends of the Czech Republic. Lived nine glorious years in Prague as the president of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. And our organization put up the Masaryk statue with the embassy. Uh, and it, he looks over the crowded Massachusetts Avenue every day. Uh, but it's, a, it's wonderful that it's there. 
I thought uh, our speakers this morning <coughs> were quite in inspiring. You're a poet, Katerina, uh, and I hope we can distribute your speech. Is it on website or is it the embassy going to distribute it? Uh, so, and I've known Shimon a long time, and you are a global citizen uh, uh, and doing wonders in civil society in the Czech Republic, but in a lot of other societies. And, and uh, I congratulate both of you for quite an outstanding, stimulating uh, um, morning, afternoon. <coughs> and I'm so pleased that this annual lecture is thriving with uh, people uh, in depth like the two of you. And I know about people in need, but people in depth. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a great thing. So Shimon, as, as president of, of American Friends of the Czech Republic, I'd like to ask you to come up and so I can give you something. <laughs> I get to give you two things. And you can, in this, in this period of freedom, you can do what you want with it. <laughs> First of all, the normal Anglo-Saxon way of congratulating people is, is a certificate of appreciation, and, and thank, you. thank you so much. And the other one, uh, may you spend it happily. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm Scott Thayer. I'm the chairman of the Friends of Slovakia. Uh, the American Friends of the Czech Republic and the Friends of Slovakia have a, a, a home and away arrangement on, on this Freedom Lecture. Right. Uh, and this is technically Tom's year, so uh, that's why he got to go first. Um, the, the, the Friends of Slovakia uh, take great pride in, in hosting these events and in having our, our, our speakers this year. I think their presentations were uh, very good food for thought, very appropriate for the, the, the international situation and the domestic situation that, we, that all of us, uh, that is to say the Czechs, the Slovaks, and the Americans find themselves uh, this year. Uh, we are the Friends of Slovakia, therefore we are not Anglo-Saxon. Um, <laughs> and so inst uh, I, instead I have, uh, as, a, as a, something for each of our speakers, um, our uh, Freedom Medal, uh, it's particularly appropriate this year because on the front of it, while it has our uh, Medal of Honor and the Friends uh, uh, from, the fr from the Friends of Slovakia, on the back it has uh, Stefanik. And this being, as many people would know, not only the 30th anniversary year for the Velvet Revolution, but also the uh, 100th anniversary year of the passing, the unfortunate passing of Stefanik, uh, so I want to present to both of you, and uh, on Tom's behalf, um, Katarina, your, your Anglo-Saxon <laughs> <laughs> representation, and for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I want to again thank everybody for coming out. I, I, this has been a memorable event for all of us, I'm sure. And uh, I, let's keep the spirit of today's event alive as we move out into the world. And again, I want to thank our co-sponsors, um, the Embassy of the Czech Republic, the Embassy of Slovakia, and our two uh, Anglo-Saxon, Czech and Slovak. <laughs> Kels. 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 Thank you very much. <laughs>